Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm going to begin with the land acknowledgement. Western University is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Lunapiwak, and the Attawandaran peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land and region of southwestern Ontario and the City of London. The local First Nations communities of this area include the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. In the region, there are 11 First Nation communities and a growing Indigenous urban population. Western values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island, also known as North America. So good afternoon. As many of you know, I'm Patrick Mann, Director of SASA, the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities. It's a pleasure to welcome you many honored guests and friends, colleagues and students to this second talk in uh, the fall 2018, 2018 SASA Speaker Series. Before I welcome Dr. Benjamin Hill, who will introduce Marin McKenna, I wanted to say a few words about the SASA program and our talk today. Why waste an opportunity with an audience? When some of you heard about the exciting and timely presentation we're about to encounter, you may have asked yourself or others, why would a specialized program in arts and humanities be hosting a talk on antibiotic use and abuse and the future of farming? But those of you who know us a little better would have recognized that this kind of talk is absolutely true to what we're about. Indeed, our strategic plan targets interdisciplinarity and experimentation in education within and beyond the humanities as core to our mission. And to be more specific, at SASA we value interdisciplinary education and the cross-pollination of ideas from diverse disciplines and viewpoints for the mutual enrichment, or I'm sorry, um, for the mutual enrichment of diverse learners and I think that's going to include all of us today. Our program's committed to providing an education where art, science, technology, and the humanities intersect in order to build, as we call it, well-rounded humans who can confidently engage with increasingly, uh, an increasingly complex world. I also think it's important to acknowledge that at SASA we support and cultivate an experimental approach to learning across disciplinary lines. So we're trying to encourage new and inventive ways to critically engage with diverse fields of knowledge and to employ unorthodox methods of study and engagement which often happens best when we emphasize experience. In that spirit, I think we are in for what I hope will be a new experience today that will undoubtedly enlighten and challenge us and perhaps take some of us beyond our comfort zones. Before I turn the mic over to Ben, I want also to quickly remind you about the overarching goal of these talks. The theme of the series, Humanize the Future, is meant to draw together a set of interrelated, arguably interdisciplinary concerns. We know that our experience of the future will be increasingly determined by new technologies and specifically that artificial intelligence will foster tremendous change as it has already. In light of this, we're asking, how will the human come to be understood and what will be the opportunities for humanity that a technologized world offers? Alongside this, we wonder how the traditional aspirations and practices of the humanities will move forward to help sustain the needs and desires of people while also enabling us to acknowledge that we live alongside the other than human. How will our humanity look in a world where we need to be increasingly ac in accountable in important ways and often new ways? Surely Marin McKenna's talk will cast a light on some of these sorts of questions, I know. Finally, a reminder um, uh, in further regard to our process today. Um, in the interest of forging a conversation about the things I've been alluding to, after the talk, three of Ben Hill's students from his Philosophy of Food course, um, which is cross-listed with SASA, will begin our Q&A with a question or two. Sarah Zapata, Tina Tran, and Adora Fernandez, through their queries for Marin, are going to help us think further about how together we will humanize the future. 
So now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Benjamin Hill, who is going to, has the honor of introducing Marin McKenna. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Marin McKenna, who is joining us uh, from Atlanta. She's an Atlanta-based science journalist. She's an award-winning author. She's the author of, of Beating Back the Devil from 2004, which is about the CDC's uh, disease, infectious disease response teams. Uh, the author of Superbug from 2010, which is about the MRSA. Uh, MRSA is a resistant staph infection. Um, and then uh, Big Chicken from 2017. All of her books are award-winning uh, science journalism. Um, She's been published in many locations, uh, many uh, venues, such as the New York Times, New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, um, Mother Jones, Newsweek, National Geographic. Uh, and she's also a fellow of very many distinguished institutions, currently a, a fellow at Brandeis University, but also at Yale, Michigan, Columbia, um, MIT, uh, among others. Uh, I'm very pleased that she's coming because my students in Philosophy Food are reviewing her book as an assignment. Uh, it's a very nice, uh, nice, it, it's uh, ghoulish was kind of how she described it earlier. It's not a nice story, but it's a very nice connection with what we're doing in the philosophy of food, which is to think about our relationship to food and the food system, what kind of relationship we would like and the costs of the, the food system that we have. So it's a very nice connection with philosophical reflection on that relationship and how we can build it for, uh, for the future of, of uh, all of us, the future of humanity. So without any further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Maren to uh, speak with us today. Thank you for those lovely introductions, and thank you faculty and students for welcoming me to this gorgeous room on this lovely campus. Um, it, it's really a thrill to have been invited. I, I think it's, particu it's particularly resonant for me to be invited to speak to the School for Advanced Studies because although this is going to be a talk about science and culture and public health, um, my secret identity is that I am actually myself a humanities person with an undergraduate degree in um, 16th century theater and 20th century poetry, which gets a reliable laugh from science audiences. Thank you for not laughing. I already feel more at home. So um, what I'm going to talk about is how we created the system of meat production that we have around the world today, which plays such a large part in our diets and in our lives. It's a question I've been obsessed with for several years, an obsession that began with my research into antibiotic resistance and ended up resulting in this book from last year, Big Chicken. It turns out that our modern system of producing the meat we eat owes its existence to two things, to antibiotics and to chicken. Antibiotics are the foundation of modern meat production since the 1950s all around the world. We've been feeding livestock tiny doses of antibiotics on most of the days of their lives to make them grow more quickly and to protect them against the diseases that arise in crowded barns and feedlots. We do that for cattle, for pigs, for other meat animals, but we did it first with chicken. Poultry, in effect, taught the rest of agriculture how to misuse antibiotics. And in some parts of the world, as I'll tell you, chicken and chicken producers are reversing that historic mistake and teaching the rest of livestock agriculture how to wean itself off of antibiotics again. So I'm going to take us through that history because it's a story that contains so many mistakes that we still make today, decades later. Mistakes of trusting 
in technology, of failing to ask questions of science, of assuming that there is only one path to progress, and especially of taking things for granted. And in this story, the thing that we take for granted the most is antibiotics. That, that's something that I think we all forget, which is that antibiotics are a pretty recent arrival in our history. The antibiotic era begins, depending on when you start counting, either in 1928, when Alexander Fleming first observes the action of penicillin on a petri dish in his lab in London, or in 1941, when the drug is given to a human for the first time. So the antibiotic era is either 90 years old or 77 years old. Neither of those are long stretches of time. And yet it's long enough that I think everyone in this room was born within it. Which means that for us, antibiotics have always been there. We have no sense of how extraordinary and how precious they are, because we've never experienced life without them. We've forgotten what our grandparents knew, which is that life without antibiotics, which is to say without guaranteed protection from the ravages of infection, is often tragic and always uncertain. In the time of our grandparents or great-grandparents, surgery and childbirth and accidents routinely were fatal. So were random injuries and childhood illnesses, and as this 1930s advert shows, something as simple as cutting yourself while shaving could endanger your life. We're now running up against the unintended consequences of failing to treat antibiotics with the seriousness they deserve. Worldwide, the power of antibiotics is being undermined by antibiotic resistance, which the chief medical officer of the United Kingdom has called as serious a threat to society as terrorism. The former Secretary General of the UN has called antibiotic resistance the greatest and most urgent global risk. We're losing the power of antibiotics because by misusing them and overusing them, we have allowed the bacterial world to adapt to them. And one of the most important avenues by which we do that is agriculture. And here's how that happened. On Christmas Day, 1948, there we go, this scientist walked into his laboratory outside New York City to check the results of an experiment. His name was Thomas Jukes. He was a native of Britain who emigrated through Canada, ended up in the United States, and become an expert in the dietary needs of chickens. He worked for a pharmaceutical firm just outside New York City, and he had, that firm had just filed a patent for the first tetracycline antibiotic, which was called oreomycin. This is what his experiment consisted of. He'd taken a bunch of just hatched baby chicks, divided them into groups, gave the different groups different dietary supplements, vitamins, cod liver oil, brewer's yeast, and to one of the groups, he gave the dried, ground-up leftovers from the manufacturing of his company's antibiotic. And when he weighed the chicks two weeks later on Christmas Day, doing it himself because he'd given his lab tech the day off for the holiday, he discovered that the birds who had received the antibiotic leftovers had gained more weight than any other birds in the experiment, twice as much weight as birds getting a standard diet. Jukes called this effect growth promotion. And he realized pretty quickly, though he didn't actually admit to it for a few years, that what was creating the effect was tiny doses of his company's antibiotic left behind in the manufacturing waste when the drug had been strained out. And with that recognition, Jukes created a new industry. Within five years, just in the United States, the amount of antibiotics given to livestock went from zero on the day he made this discovery, to 500,000 pounds a year. And today, just in the US, the total use of antibiotics in animals is almost 31 million pounds. Across the world, the total is believed to be 262 million. On a global average, at least twice as many antibiotics going into animals as into people. And this is important. Unlike in human medicine, Almost none 
of these antibiotics, a small percentage, are used to cure illness. They're given to animals that are not sick for Jukes's effect of growth promotion and to prevent disease. The reason that's important is because whenever we use an antibiotic, we're taking a risk that disease bacteria will adapt to the drug and become resistant, which is just to say, will be able to protect themselves against the drug's attack and survive when they should have been killed. We take that same risk when we take antibiotics ourselves for illness or when we give them to sick animals. But when we use antibiotics when an animal is not sick, that risk-benefit ratio between curing illness and risking resistance tips entirely over to risk. That's what we've been doing for decades when we give antibiotics to animals that are not ill to increase their growth or protect them from disease. So as I dug into this story, I was passionately interested in how we got to this point. And to explain that, I have to go back to the beginning of the antibiotic era, back to those dates that I told you about. So penicillin's the first antibiotic. Its first wide use is on the battlefields of World War II. It's rolled out in 1943, and it is a sensation. Because of that drug alone, hundreds of thousands of soldiers and sailors come home again who would otherwise have died. Once it's rolled out to civilians a year later, people who would have died terrible, lingering deaths from infection are cured in days. Sometimes it seems in hours. So after penicillin comes streptomycin and chloramphenicol, and then Jukes's company's drug, oreomycin, the tetracycline class, all the foundational drugs of the antibiotic era by 1948, there is enormous, crazy enthusiasm for them. None of them, at first, are prescription drugs. Anyone can access them, and everyone does. And that renders them both a huge public good, and for most of their manufacturers, a huge moneymaker, too. And manufacturers' desire to squeeze out just a little more profit from these magical new compounds dovetails in a pretty interesting way with something else that's happening at the end of World War II. Because during the war, the meat industry had been encouraged by governments to scale up production as much as it could to feed the troops that had been scattered all over the world. When the war ended, that guaranteed military market went away. And that left the meat industry for all the species that it raises with all the cost of that new infrastructure they would just built and with no continuing easy way to pay for its upkeep. And at the same time, because of the devastation of the war, there was a great deal of concern about what I think we can call the fragility of the food system. If you think about a war's effect, arable land had been destroyed by battles, flocks and herds had been decimated, fishing fleets even had been co-opted by navies to replace naval vessels that had been sunk. There were crop failures in Europe and in Asia, and even in the United States, there was what they termed a meat famine, which was so serious that it actually became an issue in the first election after the war in 1946. So to solve those problems and to keep meat production viable, producers needed to cut their costs. And one main way they could do that was by giving livestock cheaper feed. In the case of chickens, they turned from giving them pulverized small fish that were fished off the California coast and put them instead on grains exclusively for the first time. But grains and cereals were not so nutritious. And so they embarked at the same time on a vast search for inexpensive supplements to add to the feed they were giving them. And that's what brings Jukes into his laboratory that Christmas day, to see if given, giving to the chickens something that his company is literally throwing away, money from nothing, will change the nutritiousness of their feed. And it does. And Jukes and the scientists who come after him, who rush into this new field in the next five years, are convinced they have solved that post-war problem of feeding the world inexpensively. They see no downside to what they're doing. I find that extraordinary because just a few years earlier, Alexander Fleming, the father of penicillin, effectively the grandparent of all the antibiotics that come after, described the exact situation 
that Jukes would later create. Fleming and his collaborators got the Nobel Prize in Medicine for the discovery of penicillin in 1945. And when he stood up to give his thank you speech, he used it not to glory in his achievements and not to praise his collaborators, but instead to warn the world how fragile the achievement of antibiotics was. This is what he said. Using doses of antibiotics too small to cure an infection would allow bacteria to learn to resist the drugs. Now, Fleming was talking about people taking low doses of antibiotics, not animals, because Jukes's work is three years in the future. But these comments were very widely reported. And I find it hard to believe that Jukes had not read them at the time. Fleming was right. By 1947, two years after this speech, penicillin-resistant staff erupted in hospitals in England. It moved then to Australia. It arrived in North America by 1955, ca causing first a massive epidemic in the largest public hospital in Seattle. And all of those epidemics were front page news in the countries where they occurred. And yet, no one seems to have considered that the exact same processes that Fleming had warned about that provably created antibiotic resistant bacteria in hospitals would be likely to do the same thing on farms. Because no one thought about that, growth promoters were patented by Jukes's company and later by other companies. Jukes's company was named Letterly Laboratories. This is an advert from Merck, one of their rivals. They were licensed by the FDA in the early 1950s and then by the drug agencies of other uh, nations. And they became a routine part of the business of farming. And just a few years after that, larger preventive doses of antibiotics became routine as well. And there were really only a few lonely voices. Here, a, a female scientist named Marie Coates, who worked deep in the, the agricultural bureaucracy of the United Kingdom, warned that this was likely to be a mistake. Just as Fleming had been right, Coates was right as well. The situation that had been predicted in medicine happened in agriculture, antibiotic-resistant illness, specifically antibiotic-resistant foodborne illness, a thing that had never before existed in the world, began to emerge. And the first signs of trouble, weirdly, are in dairy production. Farmers are dosing their cows so heavily with penicillin that children who drink the milk come down with penicillin allergies, even though they've never taken the drug. Then cheesemakers begin to complain that they can't make cheese anymore because there's so much penicillin in the milk they receive from dairies that it kills the beneficial bacteria they use to make milk coagulate into cheese and to flavor it. There's an outbreak of drug-resistant salmonella all across southeastern England among people who are in no way related to each other by family or in any other uh, relationship. And a few years later, one small town in Yorkshire is devastated by the deaths of 13 children in just a couple of months, all from a drug-resistant strain of E. coli. And that final outbreak so shocks the United Kingdom that it does a really radical thing. It creates the first government action anywhere attempting to control farm antibiotic use in the form of a government commission. Governments like to create commissions. And after two years, a report which comes down to us as the Swan Report after its chairman, Michael Swan, who he went on to be the governor of the BBC. And in 1969, they made the first recommendations ever for farm antibiotic control. They recommended that the United Kingdom outlaw the use of Jukes's growth promoters and sharply restrict those preventive doses, allowing only drugs that were not important for human medicine. And somewhat to everyone's shock, those recommendations actually become law. They're passed by parliament in 1971, making that the first action by any government anywhere to control farm antibiotic use. And at that point, reasonably, attention turns to the United States, which is at the time the dominant agricultural power in the world, in addition to being the place where growth promoters were invented. And this scientist, Stuart Levy, who in 1976 undertook an experiment so lovely that no one has ever tried to recreate it because no one has to, 
set out to prove that farm antibiotics were a problem. He was then and is still now on the faculty of Tufts University outside Boston. And his experiment, if you like experiments, was really very elegant. He went in search of a property where, outside Boston where he could set up essentially an experimental farm. And he found one that had had a family egg sorting business with a lot of barns and sheds and a big family of adopted children to help him run the experiment. And with their help, he took the largest barn and he built a bunch of locked, locked pens inside it and stocked them with baby chicks. And then he went to a feed store and he bought standard feed for the chicks, some antibiotic laced and some antibiotic free. And he had the oldest daughter of the family feed certain feed to certain pens. And within just a few months, he was able to demonstrate that resistant bacteria arose only in the chickens, given the antibiotic laced feed, and then appeared in the chickens locked in the other pens who had gotten the antibiotic free feed, and then appeared in the systems of the farm family that were running the experiment for him. So with that result, Levy proved two things. First, he proved that routine antibiotic doses affect the gut bacteria of the animals that are receiving them, turning those bacteria toward resistance or increasing the proportion of them that are resistant. And that solved the mystery of how antibiotic-resistant foodborne illness was occurring. Because when animals were slaughtered, their gut contents, where those bacteria resided, would contaminate the meat they became and travel with that meat into kitchens and onto plates and into homes. But he also proved something that no one had thought about to that point, which is that as much as meat might be a vehicle for the transmission of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, animals were also a risk when they were alive because their gut contents, their manure, would become loaded with resistant bacteria, pass out of the animals into the farm environment, and then move from there by a variety of environmental pathways away from the farm a form of essentially antibiotic pollution that was untrackable. So Levy's discovery inaugurates a really sad chapter in this long story, which is that it prompts the United States government to try to act. The Food and Drug Administration informs the makers of these antibiotics who have gotten licenses from it, have had them now since the early 1950s for growth promotion, that they will have to attend a hearing and at this hearing on Capitol Hill, they will have to prove that their drugs are not a threat to human health. If they don't prove that, the FDA is going to take their licenses away. And the FDA never gets to hold that hearing because powerful congressmen uh, backed by agricultural interests tell the White House, the presidential administration, that if the, this hearing goes forward, they will threaten the entire budget of the Food and Drug Administration. And so the White House backs down and farm antibiotic use in the United States ends a kind, enters a kind of frozen stalemate that goes on for almost exactly 40 years. And at that point, the United States and also Canada, which follows the United States policies, and Britain and the rest of Europe, which follow Britain, really diverge in their approaches to sub-therapeutic antibiotic use on farms, presenting what's really two models to the rest of the world. After England, the Scandinavian countries control farm antibiotic use, and after Scandinavia, the entire European Union, which creates a partial ban on growth promoters, Jukes's use of the drugs in 1999 and a complete ban in 2006. And the United States and Canada take the empirical route and allow growth promoters and wait to see what's going to happen. And here's what happens. In 1987, hundreds of people fall ill in California because they've eaten ground beef that was once dairy cattle, dairy cattle that had been dosed with a powerful antibiotic called chloramphenicol to keep them growing, going through a few more dairy cycles. In the 1990s, thousands of Americans develop infections from drug-resistant salmonella, resistant specifically to the class of antibiotics called fluoroquinolones. If you've ever taken Cipro, You've taken the most common fluoroquinolone. Manufacturers had brought out veterinary versions of those drugs at almost the same moment that fluoroquinolones were created for humans. And that resistance meant that people who were ill 
with this drug-resistant salmonella, when they went to their physicians for help, could not be treated with the first drug that the physicians would have reached for. Starting in 2001, several teams of researchers in California and Minnesota demonstrate that some portion of the urinary tract infections that occur to millions of, Amer of women in North America every year are due specifically to bacteria traveling on poultry that is resistant as a result of antibiotic use on poultry farms. And finally, really throughout this story, researchers show again and again, as recently as last year, that if you live somewhere within a, a close geographic radius of a very large livestock farm that is using antibiotics, you are at more risk of a resistant infection because bacteria are moving away from those farms in dust, in groundwater, on the wind, via insects and rodents, and even on the skin and the clothing of farm workers themselves. Here's just one example. This is a map that was drawn up by the US CDC, and what it represents is the, the case count and distribution from a drug-resistant salmonella outbreak that occurred across 2013 and 2014, tracing back to just one chicken plant in California. 638 people in almost 30 states and Puerto Rico. And the thing about those numbers is it's pretty well accepted in public health that for any case of foodborne illness that is actually diagnosed and lab confirmed, there may be 20 to 30 more which means there were tens of thousands of people made ill by this single outbreak. And outbreaks like this, these are not confined to the United States. In 2004, farming in the Netherlands is briefly paralyzed by the discovery that a form of drug-resistant staph, resistant specifically to tetracycline, is moving from pigs in the southeastern Netherlands into farm families and then into healthcare and becomes so common and so alarming there that the Dutch government decrees that if you are a farmer of pigs and you need to go to a hospital for any reason, you will be forcibly confined in isolation because you represent such a threat to the rest of the patient population. In 2015, Chinese and British researchers reveal that there are people, pigs, and pork in China all carrying bacteria with an identical gene that confers resistance to one of the very last resort antibiotics that we have, an antibiotic called colistin, that is being used in agriculture because medicine didn't really think it needed it anymore, and agriculture adopted it. And then resistance advanced to such a state that medicine needed it back and couldn't use it anymore. And that's an important point, the fate of colistin, because what's been happening behind the scenes while more and more resistance emerges, and agriculture plays a larger and larger role in this story, is that however bad resistance might get, we always assumed there was another drug to fix it, until suddenly there was not. Since the 1970s, the rate at which new antibiotics come to market has slowed to a crawl. There's been no truly new antibiotic compound. That's not a me too improvement, a slight change in a molecule, but a truly new compound that bacteria have never experienced before for more than 30 years. And there's a good reason for that. Pharmaceutical companies have decided with what really, if you are a company, is quite defensible logic that it's not in their best interest to make antibiotics. Because the billions of dollars and 15 to 20 years that it takes to bring a drug to market are an investment that cannot be recouped in the amount of time that a drug is on the market before resistance begins to take its power away. In, in this data visualization, which was done by a research group in England, the drug only becomes profitable in year 23, which is two years in, under the United States scheme before it will be challenged by generic versions. So I look at that, and it occurs to me that in the endless game of essentially leapfrog between bugs and drugs that we've been playing, whether we want to or not, since the beginning of the antibiotic era, the bugs are getting ahead of us. We have no new drugs to counter them when they leap ahead. And it's routine antibiotic use in animals that is helping to allow them to win that game of leapfrog. 
So I find it as, when I talk about resistance that at a certain point people need to hear how serious a problem this is and not just in the rhetoric of the politicians that I quoted when I began talking. So this is what the numbers look like. It's been estimated that right now the toll of antibiotic resistance worldwide is 700,000 deaths a year. 23,000 in the United States, sorry I don't have the Canadian numbers, 25,000 in the EU. That's only deaths. Just in the US, the count of people made ill enough to go to a doctor is more than two million. And it's also been predicted that if we don't change our antibiotic use in medicine and in agriculture, the toll of death by the year 2050 will be 10 million deaths a year, a cumulative global loss of $100 trillion in gross domestic product. That's where we are because of our overindulgence in antibiotics, in agriculture and in medicine. I think of it as being on the edge of a post-antibiotic world, which would be a world in which we lose most of what we think of as modern medicine, and also most of the confidence with which we live our lives every day because antibiotics allow us to be confident. So let me tell you what that would look like. If we lost antibiotics, the first thing we would lose would be people who are uniquely vulnerable to infection. That's cancer patients, AIDS patients, transplant recipients, and premature babies. We would lose treatments that install foreign objects in the body, stents for stroke, pumps for type 1 diabetics, even new hips and knees. We'd lose the ability to perform complex surgeries because antibiotics protect patients from infection after incisions, of course, but sometimes even prophylactically in advance. And that means no heart operations, no prostate biopsies, and no cesarean sections. And the thing that bothers me the most is that we would have to learn to fear things that now are minor to us because antibiotics made them minor. Strep throat used to cause heart failure. Skin infections led to amputations. Giving birth in the cleanest hospitals killed almost one woman in every hundred. Pneumonia killed three children out of every 10 that developed it. I, I think back to that magazine advert that I showed you at the start of my talk. That was from a men's magazine that was as well, re well read in the 1930s as Esquire or Popular Mechanics is today. It warned that a shaving cut could kill you. That is not hyperbole. The very first human patient to receive penicillin, who was a British policeman named Albert Alexander, was gravely ill in hospital. He'd had amputations. One of his eyes had been removed. He oozed pus from every pore. And what he had done to bring himself to that state was to walk into his garden and scratch his face on a rosebush thorn. That's where we go if we misuse antibiotics to the point of losing them all. And though I do not by any means let medicine off the hook because medicine has plenty to ask, answer for, simply by volume, more overuse happens in agriculture than it does in medicine. And I want to remind you that though the origin of problematic use is land-based agriculture, chickens and pigs and cattle, what's true on land is true for the sea as well. In some parts of the world, aquaculture, fin fish and shrimp depends heavily on antibiotics and that is an issue for you in Canada. You're facing it on the west coast in your salmon fisheries. In fact, most large-scale production of protein depends on routine antibiotic use and that's a danger that we all have to confront because large-scale production of protein, consumption of protein, is growing around the world. As the economies of emerging nations improve, their new middle classes are buying more meat. It's one of the most reliable signals of the rise of the middle class is that meat sales start to rise. It's natural for India and China and Brazil and Southeast Asia to turn to intensive agriculture to raise that meat for their populations. There is not enough arable land in the world to put all those animals on pasture. And it's natural unless they learn otherwise, for them to turn to antibiotics to uphold intensive agriculture as well. And most of the global south has still not set 
antibiotic curbs for farming. Brazil is now the world's largest exporter of chicken. It's also one of the countries with one of the highest rates of antibiotic use. China is already the world's largest producer and consumer of antibiotics. And it's been predicted that by 2030, if policies don't change, China will be giving one third of all of the antibiotics produced in the world to its livestock. This is a, a curve drawn by the US Department of Agriculture. It's not important if you can't read the, the small print, but just look at the trend. That's where meat appetite just in China is going by the year 2025. So all nations have to confront these questions. For the good of the world, can large protein producers dial back on antibiotic use? And can we persuade our governments to change their attitude toward permitting such antibiotic use? And though to this point I have told you a very dark story, I think this is where it takes a positive turn, because I think the answer to those questions is yes. Here are some examples of why I believe this. In 2014, the American company, forgive me, the US company, Purdue Farms, which is the fourth largest poultry company in the United States, shocked its industry by announcing out of nowhere that it was taking its chicken completely antibiotic free, creating a, a sort of moral example for the rest of the US chicken industry, such that now every company but one has gone at least partially antibiotic free. It was followed by Tyson, Cargill, Pilgrim's Pride, Foster Farms, all names that you might know. In 2016, the central government of China, which was so embarrassed by that news of that colistin-resistant bacterium spreading around the world now in more than four dozen countries, that it universally banned that antibiotic from its agriculture, taking 8,000 tons of colistin off the market, out of availability for its farmers, without a second glance. In January 2017, the Obama administration in the US in one of its last acts in office finally engineered the removal of growth promoters from US agriculture, breaking a stalemate that had lasted almost exactly 40 years. And here, in January of this year, the Canadian government followed the US and banned the use of growth promoter antibiotics by the end of this year and put far all the remaining farm antibiotic use under the control of veterinarians. So you were late, but we were late too. In the US, most of the world outside Western Europe was late. It's a little surprising to me that we got there at all. And the reason why I think we got there is the reason that gives me hope. Not primarily because of the actions of governments, but because of the actions of consumers. Because in advance of the United States government moving and the Chinese government moving, coalitions of chefs and schools and healthcare systems and even just individual parents said to meat production companies that they no longer wanted to spend their money on meat raised with the routine use of antibiotics. I think that pressure, which never existed in Europe because Europe never needed it, having had regulations so early, made it safe for the North American governments to act. And it made it safe for companies to comply because they knew there was a market waiting for them. So they did move. Major meat producers and supermarket chains and food service companies just in the past four years have all renounced meat raised with routine antibiotic use, including some of the biggest restaurant chains in the world. I find that so encouraging. And yet the battle is not over because the farm antibiotic control that some nations have achieved in Europe and here in North America covers only growth promoters, not preventive drugs. At this point, there are only a handful of countries in the world that fully control farm antibiotic use. Just last fall, the World Health Organization asked all its member governments, which is almost every nation in the world, to move ahead to banning or controlling preventive antibiotic use as well. A number of nations responded, among them the new presidential administration of my country, and what the Trump administration said was no. So. <laughs>
Meanwhile, for much of the world, the availability of cheap protein is a much more important issue for the governments than either the prevention of antibiotic resistance or the ability to sell antibiotics freely. But as much as we do not move policy forward, this is a problem that is not going away. The movement of resistant bacteria from farms through societies across the co country, across the world, shows us that we can no longer pretend that one country, one ecosystem, one continent is separate from another. Foods are flown across the world in cargo. Pathogens cross borders on birds, in the wind, in the oceans, in our own bodies when we travel. Yet the temptation to place profits over public health is still with us, just as it was when this long mistake began. We have not yet fully reversed that mistake. And I think we do not have much time to get it right. Thank you very much. Hi, Marin. Um, thanks um, for coming to speak to us today. I'm Tina, and I'm a health sciences student. So my question was, after reading your book, I definitely do feel more motivated and inspired to eat less conventional chicken or just stop eating chicken um, altogether. Like many others, this motivation stems from the intention of um, being a more humane person, and this involves making more humane choices. And although I may want to practice these dietary habits at heart, I probably am not willing to pay extra money or um, make the extra effort to find these options that are high quality, free of antibiotics, and are more sustainable. So in your opinion, what do you think in, are the internal and external barriers people like myself face when trying to choose less conventional chicken? So it's a really important question, and thank you for it. Because, and in, I'm going to unpack your question a little because there's a whole bunch within it. So there's the question of should we eat meat at all? Then there's the question of should we only eat sort of good meat or happy meat? And then there's the question of if we, if if those of us who can afford it, only eat happy meat or meat that is raised without routine antibiotic use or pastured meat or meat from only small producers, doesn't that create a two-tier system? in which we are condemning people who cannot afford what we can afford to meet that is more perilous for them. So the first thing to say, I'm going to take all three of them, is that I don't think it's at all necessary to stop eating meat. Uh, I wrote this book in part because I am a meat eater, and I remain so. And, and if you read the book, you will see that the first uh, scene and the last are scenes of me stuffing my gob with delicious chicken um, in France and in New York. Uh, I, wanted to, I wrote this book because I felt it was that we, as meat eaters, we ought to be allowed to interrogate the system by which our meat is produced in order to make it better, that the only response is not to turn our backs on it and renounce the system of meat production entirely. So what do we do about the fact that um, meat raised with routine antibiotic use appears to be more expensive? Well, the answer is it, does, it isn't necessarily because there are so many players now in this market. So on the one hand, there are, of course, um, you know, be beautiful pastured birds and other species of animals growing up on gorgeous green farms in various parts of the world. Certainly, you know, where I live in Georgia, Georgia is the heart of chicken production in the United States. 1.4 billion birds a year come out of Georgia, and most of them are raised in the conventional manner indoors. But Georgia has also, because of its climate, become the center of pasture-based poultry production in the US. But we have to remember, I think, that to be antibiotic-free, a bird doesn't actually have to grow up on grass. It only has to not receive antibiotics. And I'm particularly 
encouraged by the example of Purdue Farms, which forced the rest of the, the US chicken industry to change its practices, because Purdue Farms remains a company that slaughters millions of chickens every week, possibly in millions a day. Um, they took their chicken production entirely antibiotic-free, or as they term it, no antibiotics ever, N-A-E. Um, they did that without changing the price of their chicken. They did it by taking antibiotics out and doing other inexpensive things to stimulate the immune systems of their, um, their birds instead, giving them more exercise, allowing them natural light, changing the components of their diets. So, I mean, when I, when I, I like to support smaller producers because I want to see a range of production types happening in the system for producing meat. But we can eat antibiotic-free meat and without having to buy more expensive, higher welfare, higher labor pastured animals. And it's the example of Purdue and other, the other companies that followed it Tyson is now, uh, which is also the, one of the, the larger chicken company in the United States, has invested heavily in antibiotic-free pork production as well. Cattle are going to take a little longer, meat cattle, because they have the longest lives and they move around the most. They have the most disease risks as a result. It's, it's the example of companies like that that are going to make it possible for the developing world to potentially give up antibiotics and meat production. As I said, you know, China is not going to turn to entirely pasture-based production of meat. China is already building multi-story, you know, six-story barns for chicken and two-story barns for hogs. They're very common. And, but those can be conducted in an antibiotic-free manner. Um, and that, I think, is what will solve this conundrum more than pasture-based farms will. So thanks for your question. So my name is Sarah, and for the next question, I want to touch a bit on clean meat. Recently, I've been hearing a lot about it. For those of you who don't know, um, clean meat is a source of protein that is cultured from animal tissues in a lab without the need to actually raise or slaughter animals at all. It is meant to replicate the exact taste and texture of the meat that we're accustomed to now. And it is said to be raised without antibiotics, preservatives, or antimicrobial resistance at all. And many people are excited about its role in the future of food. Uh, so my question to you is, what then is your own opinion on clean meat, and do you believe it is a viable solution uh, to fix many of the issues that we face today with animal agriculture, such as the antibiotics and AMR? And what obstacles do you see it uh, rising should it become a primary protein source in the future? It's a great question. Thank you. So I want to talk, you're asking specifically about cellular agriculture. But there's also a, an, an aspect of sort of like moving away from antibiotics that is plant-based meat. So I want to talk about both. Um, so plant-based meat is things like the Impossible Burger or um, Beyond Burger. Uh, I'm trying to think of what chains up here s uh, uh, serve them. They are, are um, burger-like or steak-like substances that are composed of plant proteins, mostly from legumes. Um, Clean meat, or cellular agriculture, or lab-based meat, is made from animal cells that have been grown outside an animal. I think they both have problems, but they're not the same problem. The, the problem I see with plant-based meat is that um, it relies on vast monocultures of legumes. You know, no one is growing the soybeans and um, Canadian yellow peas. They are actually a, the, the mainstay of um, plant-based agriculture, of plant-based meat at this point. As part of integrated farms in which many things are going on, they are growing them in, in, in enormous plantations. I think this is actually a huge uh, income now for Alberta, but I'd need to look that up. And, and I think we can see in the 20th century agriculture that a monocrop of anything is bad, is more subject to disease, requires more management, more fertilization, more water, um, that it's, uh, it is a perilous path to go down. So, so um, cellular meat, on the other hand, in its prototypes, it is absolutely antibiotic-free. I've been to a couple of the companies working on it. I've tried some of their products. They're moderately tasty. The foie gras is a little weird. Um, but uh, I, am not, I have not yet seen the numbers to convince me that then when they scale up, 
to industrial sizes, to you know, industrial reactors the size of that screen, probably, that they are going to continue to be able to be antibiotic-free. It seems to me that as you scale, the, the risks of con contamination grow up. So they're going to have to make that case to me, to convince me. But the more fundamental problem that I see with uh, cellular meat is cellular meat is going to be intellectual property. That's the only way that these companies are going to make back their investment. Now, at the moment, though most people don't know this, chickens already are intellectual property. All of the genetics of commercial chicken in the world are owned by essentially two companies. And every time chickens are a dead-end crop in the same way that most um, cereals are a dead-end crop, you go back to the seed companies for every new planting, and you go back to the genetics companies or to the hatcheries that represent them for every new set of chicks. Um, commercial chickens do not reproduce naturally. But, but hogs and cattle and ducks and sheep are all still essentially open source. I don't think it's a good idea to hand our protein production over to just a couple of Silicon Valley bros. Um, it just seems to me that we already know that their, um, they, their decision making is not necessarily in the best interest of society. Um, so uh, while I certainly wouldn't shut down research into either plant-based meat or cellular agriculture, I think on both sides there are many more questions that have to be answered before we trust either of those pursuits to replace traditionally grown meat for us. Thank you. Hello, my name is Adora. Um, you had stated that the cost-benefit ratio for pharmaceutical companies is too low to create antibiotic treatments for diseases because the drug resistance is coming within one to two years. Um, however, if all companies pursued other avenues of profit and no new antibiotics were created, just as you said, one to six people who are sick would die. Um, what would you offer as a way to entice pharmaceutical companies to compete in the industry again when there is no major benefit to them? And if the government like, does provide subsidization for these companies, do you think that it would be worth the billions of dollars in development and product production for short-lived success? That's a really excellent question. And it, it happens that this is a question that is uh, the subject of ferocious policy debate right now in the U.S. and I assume here in Canada and certainly in Western Europe as well. Um, it seems clear that in order to get more anti to get antibiotics to be produced again, we need to change the market in which they are produced. The market as it is for our antibiotic R&D is broken. So how do we do that? So the proposals that have been made are a variety of what are called push and pull incentives. And I always get confused which belongs in which bucket, so I'm not going to label them that way. I'm just going to describe them. <coughs> it has been suggested that we could give companies longer patents on drugs, or we could give them Me Too patent extensions in which they get extra, uh, extra years of exclusivity on other drugs that they make. Um, it's been uh, suggested that we give them what are called market entry rewards, which is basically if a company gets an antibiotic all the way out to the market, <coughs> you write them a big old check of about $2 billion. And that relieves them of the pressure of having to make back their R&D by pushing sales into the market, because the faster you sell an antibiotic, the faster you use it, the faster you use it up. I myself, I don't think that market entry rewards are going to fly, because I don't think that, that um, with the deficit certainly the way it is in the United States at the moment of trillions of dollars, um, that anyone, any member of the public is going to accept our writing $2 billion checks to pharma companies. So what do you do instead? Um, I don't think anyone knows, but where I do think we're going is with a recognition that even if we did all those things that I just described, gave them longer patents, gave them protection for other things that they do, wrote them big old checks, that still only solves things for maybe one drug per company, one time. So you write a pharmaceutical company a $2 billion check for one drug, and then that drug gets used up. 
And what does the, com what does the public say the next time you want to write the $2 billion check to the same company for another drug? That is not a sustainable system. Um, I, I had a conversation with a, an antibiotic researcher, and, you know, drug developer, and also clinician recently, and in which you know, he said to me, everything we are talking about right now to get antibiotics back into the market is really only solving the next 20 years. But what we need is to solve the next 200. And what I've started to think about is that if we look at, we continue to look at antibiotics as discrete individual products that we finance onto the market or we pull onto the market and then we allow to fail. They may be the only thing that are that crucial to our society that we allow to fail on their own. We don't do that for bridges. We don't do it for military hardware. So maybe we should be financing antibiotics like civilian infrastructure or like military hardware. Maybe we should be contracting them, no, looking for not what we need in the next five years, but what's the, the tank or the fighter plane or the bridge across a gorge that we need 25 or 50 years from now and design with a, a sense of a long now to meet the needs that we think we'll have and the market that we think we'll have. That would require a completely different um, pr uh, pricing and funding structure. Um, but I'm willing to see someone try it because it's clear that the pricing and the funding structure that we have now doesn't work. Thank you for your question. So, Marion, I think if, uh, with your indulgence, maybe we could take a few more questions. If anyone has questions, I am happy to answer them. Are there? <clears throat> Yes, Wilson. Uh, yes, I may have missed this, but how much of the antibiotic use is based on farmers' requests for fatter animals? Or so that's the, um, against the, the uh, pharmaceutical industry pushing it for profit? Your opinion? Are we talking only in agriculture, or are you asking me for medicine as well? What's that? I'm sorry. Yes. Are the, the, when you said the pharma, are you, are we t do you want me to confine my answer to agriculture? Is agriculture pushing the use or is pharmaceutical pushing the use? So that is an interesting question. Most of my exploration has been about chicken. So let me explain how uh, poultry production works in most of the world. Um, farmers don't actually own the chickens that they buy. They just kind of rent them. Um, the, the, the poultry industry in the industrialized world is a marvel of what's called uh, vertical integration, in which companies own the feed mills, the genetics, the hatcheries, the breeding pyramids, um, the, the places where, where the, the baby chicks, I guess that's the hatcheries, the baby chicks are born, um, the, the slaughterhouses, the distribution networks, and the salespeople. Um, a, a poultry company with whom a, con a farmer has contracted will bring the chicks to the farmer and come back for deliver the feed to the farmer periodically over the 42 days that those chicks will live and then come back and fetch them to be slaughtered 42 to 47 days later. That means that the farmer doesn't actually have much of a say into what's going into the feed. So it's not the individual farmer in the case of poultry, it's the company, which could be Foster Farms or Purdue or Sanderson or something like that. Um, now, that means that the responsibility is on the company, but it's not necessarily the farmer. It's a little bit different for, um, for places that are not, um, for, excuse me, for industries that are not vertically integrated. Pork is somewhat integrated, cattle is less so. Um, there's more individual decision making on the, allowed to the farmers. In the United States, uh, and I think it's also true for Canada, up until just a couple of years ago, agricultural antibiotics were completely over the counter. Um, you could go to a farm supply store uh, if you were, you didn't even actually have to prove you were a farmer and, and buy any antibiotics that you felt like giving to your animals. Um, I can prove this because on my desk at home, I have a two pound bag of Jukes's drug, oreomycin, which I bought over the internet. And the only question anyone asked me when I ordered it was what my credit card number was. I don't bring it as a prop because um, Immigration officials don't generally like you coming across borders with large bags of drugs. Precisely because there was so much individual um, 
latitude allowed farmers. <laughs> one of the innovation, not innovations, but one of the regulatory changes that um, the Obama government and now the Trudeau government is making is to put antibiotic use on farms under the control of veterinarians. So effectively, a prescription has to be written. You, can't, you are not supposed to be able to buy agricultural drugs over the counter or over the internet any longer. Whether that's going to work is an open question, not so much because people are going to want to cheat, but because there are not that many large animal veterinarians in either of our countries anymore. And if you are a farmer and you have a herd that is sickening and you think you know what the, your herd needs, but you have to wait for your veterinarian to get there and your veterinarian is 300 kilometers away, you may be tempted to do a little adjusting of your herd's health on your own. So, so now why are the, why are the, the how, how is it that the companies and the veterinarians are so incentivized to, um, uh, uh, to, to want to give antibiotics. First, it's been an industry standard for 70 years. But second, who, do you, who, who funds agricultural colleges? In the United States, it's almost entirely veterinary pharma. So, um, so someone who goes through an agricultural college and comes out as, as a, a, a veterinary technician or a field technician um, already has a positive attitude toward the use of antibiotics and other agricultural drugs because it was literally biased into their training. That was a very long answer, I'm sorry. Great. <clears throat> Other? So that way everyone else can hear you. I just wanted to touch on uh, how you talked about a, a fundamental change in how the uh, industry creates the patents for medicine. So looking at it from an infrastructure point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in the U.S. right now, but also in Canada. If, if there's no desire by the public to accept, say, a $2 billion check for a one-time uh, patent, how do you think that the entire system could be restructured so that it becomes an infrastructure instead of a capitalistic goal at this point? Um, I admit this may be wishful thinking on my part. <laughs> this is the point at which I, uh, I, I uh, sort of divert from my research and um, uh, uh, revert to technological optimism. But the reality is we have to do something, right? The market is broken and it's never coming back. Um, and and we, you know, we, don't, we don't have to, tr to imagine giving $2 billion checks to pharma companies to know that these kind of incentives are not going to work because we can, there were two stories just recently that show us how the public, at least in the United States, feels about pharma companies making a lot of money. And that is that um, two separate pharma companies um, who had not done any R&D themselves went, actually they're not technically pharma companies, they were essentially, maybe they were hedge funds, but they were you know, entrepreneurs, went out and bought old out-of-patent drugs. Um, in the first case, uh, uh, Dalbavancin, um, and in the second case, this one was just a few weeks ago, a drug called nitrofurantoin, which is um, very important for urinary tract infections. And they hiked the prices from pennies to like $4,000 a dose. And they were pretty much, one of the, the heads of one of those companies, Mar I always say his name wrong, Martin Schreckelli, the guy who also hiked the price of the EpiPen is now in jail, um, though he's not actually in jail for his pharma pricing, but for, um, for securities fraud. Uh, the, other, the, the head of the other company has been incredibly defiant and has, has said basically he has a moral obligation to make as much money off this drug that he did not develop as, um, as he can. Uh, there have practically been pitchforks in the streets over these two stories. Um, so, so what do we do to get past that? I, maybe a nonprofit structure? Um, uh, you know, we don't, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna stop there because I'll just start spinning and I'll run out of fact fairly fast. <laughs> but I appreciate the question. I admit that I don't know how to solve this. You know, the, the guy who came up with the $2 billion checks was the former chief economist of Goldman Sachs. He's one of the brightest economists on the planet. He was named to solve the, the antibiotic problem by former Prime Minister David Cameron, and he didn't get it right. So I think my chances of getting it right are not that great. But thank you for your question. Okay, the class over here is all waiting till tomorrow morning, I know, so you don't like have to ask me things in public. 
Um, relating to plant-based meats and cellular agriculture animal products, what can companies working to change the future of food learn from the consumer response to antibiotics? I knew you would ask about that. <laughs> um, what can companies learn from consumer pressure that caused change in how meat, meat is currently produced? So I think there's a couple of things. For the first is that the public really has turned away from routine antibiotic use. I don't think they're going to accept it in their meat anymore. Um, it's easy to say that in uh, uh, societies as um, privileged as North America and Western Europe, but it's also true in China, where many, many of the people buying meat, and India, where many of the people buying meat are not privileged at all, and yet they are still speaking up about this problem. So first is to understand that that antibiotic use is going to be a permanent stumbling block. And if antibiotic use um, becomes a feature of cellular agriculture as it scales up production, I think that's going to be a problem. On the other hand, if cellular agriculture actually can do this in an aseptic manner, that's a, a huge selling point. Um, the, the thing that is really kind of amazing to me still is that consumer pressure really worked in this situation. Now, to be clear, um, it didn't work only because moms were going to the customer service desk at their local supermarket and saying, I don't want to buy this chicken because it says antibiotics. It worked because the very large buyers were recruited into the problem. The, the first of those was the healthcare system of the University of California, which uh, about eight years ago now said to its wholesalers, that it was going to take its institutional catering budget, which is massive, and s deliberately spend it on antibiotic-free meat. Because if there were resistant bacteria on the meat that they were feeding their patients, it was going to put their patients at risk. Um, they were followed by the Chicago Public Schools, which is the third largest school system in the United States. They did the same thing. Um, so in the same way that, you know, when we talk about campaigns like you know, plastic straws. Uh, and it feels like we're putting all the pressure on consumers to use one less straw at Starbucks when what really should be, we really should be doing is getting the power of very large, large corporations to lean on the plastics problem. The, the activism against meat raised with routine antibiotic use shows that, the, that the, the power of big buyers is really important. And so to me, that, that raises the question who are the really big buyers going to be for cellular agriculture? Are there, are there going to be, or should there be, is that, is that the market that cellular agriculture should be going for? Not, you know, doing demos in fancy little bistros, but, you know, trying to attract the catering system of a university, maybe, something like that. I think we may be at a point where we are going to wrap up. That's fine. Um, Maren, I wanted to say that it was a scintillating uh, talk, discussion, and your, your responses to the questions are really, really helpful. I think it's amazing the way you work at the nexus of, as a journalist, work at the nexus of science and agriculture and medicine and really bring together a very complex world in a way that I certainly feel like I understand just a little bit better. So I want to thank you for that. And thank you on all our behalves just for a really scintillating talk and congratulate your uh, English professors on the fact that you're so wonderfully articulate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.